Hello and welcome. I'm Kamla. On today's show, we are going to talk about a very different aspect of Silicon Valley. We are going to take you back to the 19th and the 20th century and talk about a time when Silicon Valley or Santa Clara Valley, which is one of the counties uh, that Silicon Valley consists of, was famous for its fruits and wines. At one point, Santa Clara Valley was known as the garden spot of the world, and California is the nation's great vineyard, according to Charles Sullivan, a very well-known historian of wine and wineries in California. So today with me is Vic Vani of Solis Winery. He is from Santa Clara or Silicon Valley, actually, right? Yep, my whole life. Whole life you grew up here? Yep. Okay. But you have a very interesting story because you actually saw the change come over in Silicon Valley. Before it was Silicon Valley, it was known as Valley of? The Valley of the Heart's Delight, I believe. Why was it known as the Valley of Heart's Delight? Oh boy. Uh, I probably because of what you said, there's a lot of fruits and vegetables grown in this area. and. Uh, uh, the immigrants that came to this this area, they 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 prospered with that. Um, I, I'm guessing. I really uh, don't but know. But you the saw it. You uh, saw I, I did see it, and I saw I saw it. it I, my parents saw it more, but I saw the the agricultural change quickly into Silicon Valley. I remember as a kid seeing uh, uh, fields and and uh, you know orchards and and whatnot uh, all start to change into uh, into high tech. Mm. And you y you had a very interesting story. Your family story is very interesting. Your grandfather came from Italy. Yes. And in the 20th century there were a lot of Italian immigrants who came to this part of California. Correct. And um, where did your grandfather come from? He well, he came from Tuscany, um, a small city near Lucca, and um, yeah, he came here when he was a young a young man, and uh, ended up in San Francisco somehow. Uh, I guess you know friends of family or whatever, and uh, he, he got involved in agriculture when he came over. He was a very um, uh, sharp and, and smart individual and very resourceful so he was able to uh, to use the, the contacts that he had and, and uh, come here and and uh, ultimately start his own business what was it uh, he got into well he, he was in, in farming originally he was in uh, apricots and and, and and that and then he rolled into the cut flower industry and cut so flowers Yes. Cut flowers in this area? Uh, yeah, there used to be a lot of cut flowers in this area. Mountain View, uh, Sunnyvale, a lot of cut flowers, uh, carnations, miniature carnations, and uh, those flowers, even field flowers, uh, they were brought to the San Francisco market. There's a flower market in San Francisco, and they would they would pack everything up on s in the middle of the night and get to the uh, the flower market in San Francisco uh, at three o'clock in the morning and sell flowers there. Yeah. And today, Mountain View is synonymous with Google. Yes. Sunnyvale is synonymous with startup uh, companies. Yeah. And I think the flower market in San Francisco is where all the unicorn and startups are there, right? I don't know. I think the flower market's still there. Isn't it's still it? there, but yes. it's surrounded by all these newfangled right. uh, high tech companies. Yes. Yeah. So, so your grandfather got into the cut flower business, and what you're telling me is that if I was to go down Central Expressway, that's where your grandfather's business was? Yes, yeah, Bernardo. Um, yeah, I think Yahoo is right down in that area too. There's a, a lot of high tech. In All there. those were nurseries? They were, yeah. And it, who, who, who uh, grew the flowers? And, and orchards, a lot who, of orchards. Who, who grew the flowers? Uh, my, my grandfather did. Um, you know, it was all greenhouses back then. So if you look back, uh, you know, we have photos of, you know, miles and, or not miles, but uh, acres and acres of greenhouses in that area. And, and it was all miniature carnations and carnations for the most part. And you grew up, you, you saw those flowers. Oh yeah, we used, to, we used to actually sleeve miniatures. So we had a, uh, uh, we used to bunch them and we put the bunches in this little tube and we'd pull the plastic sleeves over them. When I was a 10 year old kid, we used to do that, uh, um, you know, me and my cousins, we'd stand there all day and do that. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And now when you, go, when you go to these areas, what comes, what memories uh, flood your being when you go to Mountain View or Sunnyvale? Oh, uh, yeah. All you, what we see is interesting when we go to the the property where the nursery used to be. There's still trees there that I remember as a kid. Olive trees that used to be by my grandfather's house. Um, they had Italian cypresses all through the property, and so some of those trees are actually still on the property. Uh, it's, yeah, the, the memories are, are funny because uh, you know you, 
the greenhouses are all gone, and, but you can still see little little bits of history that are still there um, that remind you of how the property was situated and what we did as kids and running around in that area. And the cut flower business has disappeared from this area. Yeah, uh, that's that happened. This area it, it got pushed out because of high tech and then a lot of the nurseries moved to um, Watsonville and Salinas and uh, that's where a lot of cut flowers, uh, roses and carnations and miniature carnations and moms were grown. And over time and due to, I believe it was a Andean trade agreement, uh, a lot of cut flowers started to come out of South America and that impacted our business greatly. And so ultimately we got out of the business and I just heard the other day that the last uh, remaining uh, rose grower in Northern California closed down uh, about a year ago. Yeah. And you would never know that? No. No, and it was a, a prolific uh, uh, industry in, in Wattsville and Salinas for a long time. So how did your family transition and go into the wine growing business? Because w there have always been uh, wineries in and around this area. In mm -hmm. fact, Saratoga still has a really well-known uh, winery, Ridge Winery. Right, yes. You know, uh, where the winemakers were very famous. Yes. So how did your dad or your grandfather, who transitioned? Uh, my, my father did. Uh, yeah, my grandfather had passed away. Um, my father had, and us, our family uh, moved to Gilroy uh, in 1980. Which is known as the garlic capital. Correct, <laughs> yes. And there are wineries down there. There have always been wineries down there. In fact, I think wineries, uh, some of these wineries go back 100 years. But uh, we, we were in the flower business and we just moved closer to our, our, our business that was in Watsonville. But when we did so, we moved onto a vineyard. And as a kid, we moved on to the small vineyard, and my dad, as an Italian, uh, uh, you know, has Italian ancestry, got involved in making wine. I remember my great grandfather coming down and helping him make the first batch of wine. Your great grandfather? Yes, he was still alive. This is my my grandmother's father. And uh, did they live here in California? Or they yeah, came from they Italy? lived in Northern California, but but they but they grew up in Italy. Um, he was actually in World War One in in uh, for Italy. Um, wow. <laughs> so anyway, he, he made wine with my dad the first year, 1980. And, um, you know, my dad was just playing around in, in, in it. But my dad was a good grower. You know, my dad had been in agriculture his whole life. He knew how to grow uh, roses and flowers and, and even like trees and, and uh, fruit. So grapes w w were easy for him. And Why are they easy? Why do we hear stories that, you know, grapes are not that easy and that this was not a good year for harvesting grapes? Well, okay, that's different. Okay. You, you, yeah. Growing them is one thing. Getting a good production out of it sometimes can be challenging just because of Mother Nature. Oh. But, you know, my dad has a green thumb. So, you know, he can, he can pretty much grow anything. And he decided to replant some, some of the vineyard and got a little bit more interested in what was going on. And then ultimately... Uh, in the late 80s, uh, there was a winery that, that we grew up next to. It was right next door, and they actually went into a foreclosure, and my dad bought the, the winery out of foreclosure and got into the wine business there R with really no wine experience except he knew how to grow grapes. So you're a relatively young uh, winery uh, in, in the sense that... 25 years old. To, yeah, the, because yes. of your family, but the vineyard itself has been in existence for a long time. Uh, yeah, the winery that was on site before uh, started in the 20s. So there, the winery itself is about 100 years old, uh, but our family has owned it for 25 years. So did you grow the existing wines or you know the grapes or did you have to bring new varietals and grow? Yeah, back in the old days uh, when the Italian immigrants came and planted grapes, they planted uh, field blends which were um, blended, you know, they were um, vineyards with multiple different grape varieties in them and they would just pick them all together and throw them all in one, one so batch. So they'd make the jug wine? Basically, yes. And um, and so when my dad started it, started getting involved, he started to get a little bit more uh, tailored to what the market was looking for. He planted Chardonnay and, and uh, Merlot. This was back in, in mid 80s. And then when he took over the winery, he started to plant other varietals, Sangiovese. Uh, Which is a Italian. <laughs> it is, yeah. It's an Italian varietal from Tuscany. Um, but you can find it here, obviously, in California. But uh, he, so he started to, um, really get more uh, clarity on what kind of wines we were going to make. And 
that was the time when the wine industry in California was actually booming too. The mid 80s was when Napa started to get really big. And so there was kind of a big push back then to, to identify yourself with certain varietals. That, is that because of the blind tasting that happened in the 70s in Paris and yeah, you that know, was in 76, seven, and I believe that that probably had some impact on, on um, the way Northern California was looked at for wines, and it certainly affected uh, uh, Napa, and it just kind of pushed into to the, to our area. But yeah, our area used to be known as just kind of, uh, you know, jug wines. And oh, Vinegar Alley? Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. Why is that? Is it because, why was it called, was it lacking uh, the uh, aromatics and why, why was it known as Vinegar Alley? I, well, what happens is if your wine isn't clean, if you're not doing good wine, it ultimately will turn into vinegar. Uh, it, it can change the vinegar and if you have vinegar in your establishment, the wines that you make can be affected and turn into vinegar because there's, there's uh, uh, because your barrels are, are, are tainted. And so once you have that, it's a problem and it's hard to get rid of it. And, and my guess, and I didn't drink the wines back then, I was too young, <laughs> but my guess is that some of those wines had too much what we call volatile acids in them. And so they have this, this tendency to lean towards vinegar flavor. You know? Okay, so it's yeah. in the way the, it was processed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You yourself uh, went to uh, you know, uh, school to study agriculture. Yes. And is it because you wanted to become a winemaker? Why did you go to school and study agriculture? No, I did. I had no idea I was going to be in the wine business when I went to went to college. Uh, in fact, my dad didn't even own the winery at the time. Uh, we had the cut flower industry and, or the cut flower business in Watsonville, and that was where I was intending to, to make my career. And so I got into ag business at Cal Poly, and. Uh, you know, the, the, wine, the nursery went away, the, the cut flower nursery went away about 10 years later, and um, I looped back around and ended up in the wine business, but uh, was not my intentions. How long have you been in the wine industry? Uh, nine years now. So are these bottles uh, ones that you make now? Yeah, my brother actually is the winemaker, and so he has made all of these wines. So uh, it's a family business? Correct. Okay. So. Uh, what have you learned in these nine years? What was your biggest challenge <laughs> in, in executing and bringing these bottles to the market? Oh boy, what's the biggest challenge? You know, the thing about the wine business that's so unique and especially for what we're doing is that you are taking a product from the ground, you know, we're, we're growing the grapes and we're taking it all the way to the end consumer. There are very, very few industries in, that I know of that you can do that in. You know, uh, most industries will parcelize those out, but it's talk vertical integration. You look at vertical integration, we are fully vertically integrated. So you grow the grapes, you pick the grapes, and then you crush them, mm -hmm. and then you put them in your tankers. Yes, they like ferment. They ferment. Mm -hmm. And then, how long do, do wines typically ferment? Uh, three to six weeks, they'll sit and ferment, yeah. Okay, yeah. and then you test and see whether the wine is ready and then you bring it to market. Yeah, well, y we don't have to test it. We know when the fermentation is over with, yes. Oh, yeah. How does it smell when the fermentation is on? How does the, the, the shed or wherever you? Yeah, um, it is a distinct smell. It's a smell that I grew up with because we used to make wine in our basement and um, it's hard to explain. Is it overpowering? It's not overpowering. It's actually nice. It's a nice smell. It's it's like fresh wine smell. It's um, you know it's juice. It's it's grape juice. It's that's changing, um, but and that but then you, ha you have that wine side to it also. You smell the wine and uh, I don't know, there's a sharp taste. Is it a sharp or is it a pleasant taste? Well, when it's young like that, it, it's a little bit sharper, yeah. It takes okay. some time to mellow it out, and that's why you, on the red wines, for sure, you hold uh, for a while. Okay. Mm -hmm. What are the wines that you have here today? I brought three wines that I think kind of show, they're all very, very different, but kind of show how we, um, we structure things or how we do things. One is our Vino Roseo, and that's a rosé that's made from Sangiovese. It's 100% Sangiovese. It's a blush, so it's just slightly sweet. You're paying homage to your Italian heritage, so the first wine yes. that you're picking is Sangiovese. Yes, <laughs> but it is a rosé from Sangiovese, so it's not a red, and, and normally ro uh, you know, Sangiovese will be red. This one happens to be a rosé. We also make a red Sangiovese. I did not bring that, though. Okay, so when, so are you going to pour out a little for us? Oh, sure, taste? yeah, yeah. And so when you, 
when you uh, drink wine, what is it that you actually look for? Because mm -hmm. it's so confusing. You know, they say, stick your nose in, you smell, and mm -hmm. then take a sip, swirl it. And then you're supposed to smell the cock sometimes. You know, when you go to a mm -hmm. restaurant, it's a little bit, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, disconcerting because... Uh, People can make it that way. It doesn't have to be that complicated. You know, those of us that are in the business, we make it complicated or it's complicated for us because we want to know all the characteristics of the wine. But really for the consumer, you're really looking to find, are there flaws in your wine? How would I know if there's a flaw in the Okay, wine? smelling the cork. Uh, the reason why you do that is sometimes you get a cork that's bad. And what happens is you get a cork, and they call it being corked. The wine is corked. Mm. And um, I don't understand all the chemical chemistry behind it, but if you open a bottle of wine, you smell it, and you notice that there's this musty, almost like dirty, uh, wet towel kind of a, a smell and sometimes you'll get that you'll know that your wine is tainted with uh, what's called corked and uh, that's a bad wine you don't want to drink that it happens because the cork is bad not because the wine is bad uh, but sometimes you're going to find a wine that is bad also um, it could taste like vinegar um, it could have other qualities to it that you smell it and say, okay, this is not a good wine. Um, but so, so be practical about it. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. It, it, you know, it, it's, it doesn't happen that often, but it does happen periodically. So that's why you do kind of test it. But for the most part, the wines in California, the wines you get around here, if they're, if they're not very, very old, they're going to probably be okay. Mm. Um, mm. You know, for those of us in the wine business, we test it a little bit closer. We want to smell it. We want to know, we want to identify the, the characteristics in it uh, as far as uh, what we call descriptors. You know, what does it smell like? What does it taste like? So what is the descriptor? What are the descriptors for th this wine? A couple of descriptors for this wine might So are you supposed be, to do this? Yeah, okay. So, you know, we're going to practice tasting wine. So always hold it by the stem? Yes. Unless, unless you have a, a, a wine that's too cold and you want to warm it because a red wine sometimes you want to actually warm it if it's too cold so that it will open up okay it lets out uh, some of the flavors and aromas but this one is actually a, a, a rosé that we want to drink chilled so we don't want to warm it up so yes hold the stem you're using four senses when you're drinking wine okay you're using your sense of sight smell uh, taste and feel so the sight, touch. so the sight, we is looking at the color yeah. of the wine, right? Okay. And you're looking to see if there's anything, if it's cloudy, if it looks, you know, our wines are filtered, so we don't have a lot of cloudiness. But you're going to find some wines that will have some cloudiness to it. It doesn't necessarily mean it's bad, but some uh, some growers or some winemakers will unfilter their wines, keep their wines unfiltered, and so it'll be a little bit heavier or cloudier. Um, you're looking at color mm. again. It's just kind of for fun, but just to say, hey, what does it look like? Um, and then you're going to smell it. And you're going to get smell, you know, pink grapefruit, watermelon, strawberry is what the we citric, get off of this uh, one. The, the, the citrus family. Uh, some of it's citrus. You might get a little bit of citrus. I think pink grapefruit would be that, but watermelon too, and cherry, and, and um, I think we had maybe even nectarine on this one. Um, okay. And then, yeah, then so sip it? Yes. To me, I get a lot of pink lemonade on mm. this one, mm. and then like cran apple juice. So that's the, those are the descriptors. Those are descriptors. That does, has nothing to do with what's in the wine. It's all grapes, but you, we use descriptors from other things that we know to, dis, to, um, uh, to describe. describe what the wine tastes like. Okay. Is that the same as aromatics? Aromatics, well, that's uh, that's one phase of descriptors, but yes, I mean, it, aromatics doesn't have anything to do with what you're tasting or feeling, but it has to do with what you smell. Okay, how do you, how do those uh, flavors uh, infuse the wine? You know, you mm -hmm. said, oh. is it from the soil or is it? How does it come? You know, it's always been a puzzle to me. You know, right. when you describe the wines, you know, in different uh, yeah. fruit flavors. Yeah. And sometimes I've even heard the wine described with tobacco, leather. Yeah. Where do those flavors come from? There's so many different ways that those flavors can c come in. There's, there's, uh, there's so many variables you know, between weather, between um, you know how you process or how you you uh, handle your vineyard. You know wh what's the soil like? Uh, you know it could be even when we had the fires in 2008. 
those that affected some of the wines, you know, with, oh. with flavoring. So, you know, the variables are, are immense and who knows what, because we can have a Sangiovese from the same vineyard each year and they're, they're not always the same. So Is it because of the microclimate of this region? Well, well, every region. Every region has its own climate. Every region is a little bit different. And um, so, yeah, you're going to have, the grapes are not going to be different. They're going to be different from one location to another. That's, yeah, that's, uh, so that's the uniqueness about wines and why, why when people buy wines, they're always looking at certain areas, what areas they like, what areas they don't like. So can we read the label? Tell us how to read the label because the oh old wine and new wine labels are different. Right. Uh, aren't they? Well, yes. And I'm not going to go into how to read a French bottle of wine. Because oh, really? As, as a winemaker uh, and as a vineyard well, owner? Yeah. <laughs> so this is new wine? Th this would be like new, they call it new, new world, world wine. New world wine. Right. Yeah, okay. So, well, this one is, is Solis Winery is, is, the, is the wine, the, the name of the winery. And then we call it Santa Clara Valley is the appellation. That's our appellation. We're, we're from Santa Clara Valley. Now, you might see Napa or you Santa might see... Santa Clara Valley, which basically is Silicon Valley. Correct. Right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, 2015 is the year that the grapes were actually harvested. And then this is our, our name for those, this particular wine, Vino Roseo de Sangiovese. Um, most of the wines, like Merlot, will just say Merlot on it. So that's the varietal. But ours is actually a proprietary name for this wine because it isn't necessarily a Sangiovese. It's a rosé made from Sangiovese. So as a consumer, what am I supposed to look for when I look at a bottle of wine? Because you Okay, know, that's a good question. And it, the, the most simple way to, to look at, at finding better wines is to make sure that the Appalachian, Santa Clara Valley, um, actually has has a specific area. If it says just California on it, that means that the, the wine was blended from grapes anywhere in California. So they so contracted and they... Yes, okay. or they found grapes that, or grape juice that was cheap and they put it together. And so the tighter you get on your on your appellation or your, your specification designation of where the wine came from, the more likely the quality will be higher. Doesn't guarantee it, but the more likely it will be. Okay, so are we going to taste the other yes. two wines? Yes, Do okay, we need so, so this has a nice, fresh uh, taste mm -hmm. and it's pleasant. Is that a good way to describe it? Yeah, it's crisp, but it has a little bit of sweetness to it, mm. is the way I would say it. Um, th there's a little bit of sugar, but just enough um, crispness or acid on it that kind of balances it out. Good for a nice summer day. Great for a summer day or with Asian food, anything that's got a little bit of sweetness or spiciness to it. Uh, those are the This is a good wine. Very good, yeah. Okay, the next one is going to be? Mm. All right, let's do the Merlot. Okay. So the, this Merlot I brought, um, this is our estate Merlot, uh, which means that we grow the grapes ourselves on our property. Um, and this one I brought because this one won uh, a double gold and the what does it mean as an end consumer? Uh, if you want a double gold, what, okay. should, what should I be looking for? A double gold means that we put it in a competition and it, it got a certain amount of points, uh, 95 or 96. I think this one actually got 98. And it also won the best Merlot of the, the, uh, of the competition. This was at the California State Fair uh, wine competition last year. So this one I brought because it was the best Merlot in the entire competition at the California State Fair last year. And were there a lot of uh, competitors for you uh, for this for this Merlot category? Merlot is probably one of the most widely grown grape in California. So yes, I'm sure. I don't know exactly how many uh, uh, competitors there were, but there had to be a lot. Okay. And what are the descriptors we're looking for this wine? Yeah, this one's going to be a little bit more raspberry, cherry, and then there's some herbaceousness to it also. So there's a little bit of maybe... Um, Oh, herbs, green, uh, you know, there, there might be something along those lines in here. Yes, uh, I can smell the herbs. Yeah. Right. And this one's going to be a, very soft on the tongue, not a lot of tannins, um, pretty smooth, almost silky. So it's not rough. Mm-mm. It's probably rougher than normal, rougher than our normal Merlot would be. But a great wine for uh, a meat dish or something along those lines. 
Okay. Yeah. So this is the th then we since we only have two minutes left, I want to talk about Karamia because that's okay. a wine that your dad named. You want me to just show it? And yeah. Okay. Yeah. The Karamia. Okay. My dad. My dad didn't name the Karamia. And uh, the reason he named it Karamia, there's two reasons. Karamia was a name of a rose, a red rose that we used to grow when we were in the flower business. And uh, that was my dad's favorite rose. And uh, the other reason is in Italian, Karamia means uh, my dear. And uh, so if, if you look at our wines that we do, we do three blends that we have. Uh, this is one of our blended wines. Uh, all three of them have Italian uh, names like Caramia. Um, so we try to keep that, that Italian side to what we're doing. So you're paying homage to your exactly. Italian heritage. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So if I was to ask you to describe Solis Winery in two sentences, how would you describe it? In Trick two, question. In two Trick sentences, question. Uh, <laughs> boy. Um, I'd say uh, it, we do, tr uh, we're using traditional methods in what we do, and boy, oh boy, uh, yeah, the 30 second, the... Um, the pressure is on. Yeah, the pressure <laughs> is on. It, it, very family oriented, uh, all uh, Italian kind of style, and everything we do is geared towards wine with food. And uh, my, my, our tasting room manager is a, a culinary chef. So, and my brother and I, we grew up with wine at the dinner table. So wine to us is really uh, part of our meal. And very accessible. Yes. You want to make it very accessible. Yes. So you're literally less than 30 minutes away from San Jose, the, you know, which yeah. is where we are shooting this program. Yes. You're literally 30 minutes away from Silicon Valley, in Silicon Valley's backyard, and yet many people, I think, do not know that there are wine yards and wineries yeah. in where you where Solis is located. Yeah. We hear it all the time. Yeah. You hear it all the time? Yeah. Well, it was a pleasure to have you on the show, Vic, and we hope to see you again sometime yeah. soon. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching. We'll be back again with another edition. Until then, goodbye.